Okay, good evening everyone. It's 802 and we'll start the session now. Good evening uh, and a very warm welcome to the final session of this year's Thursday Talk Shop Season 3. And today we have a behind the scenes special with a specialist associate who works with me at the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum. And his name is uh, Mr. Muhammad Zaki bin Zafran. Okay, so without further ado, I'll hand the session over to him. And uh, just, uh, just to let everyone know that if you're comfortable with switching on your videos, it'll be great so that our speaker has some faces to speak to. Okay? If you have any questions during the program, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll uh, try to answer as many of them uh, as possible. But we're going to have quite a large amount of Q&A today. So you can also ask him your questions directly. Okay, so Zaki, you can start now. Hi, hello. Uh, very good evening to everyone watching. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in tonight, making some schedule to, to join us today. Um, let me just share my screen. Is it sharing? Okay. Okay, cool. So, it's not. It is, it is. Okay, so before I begin, uh, a brief background about myself. My name is Zaki Safarwan. I've been in a museum for about five years plus, and I am I work mostly in the collections, uh, specifically under the crustacean collections. Uh, for those of you who do not know, crustaceans are crabs, shrimps, prawns, lobsters, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, usually found deep in the sea. Okay, so um, before we begin. What is the Natural History Museum? Okay, so <clears throat> like all museums, I'm just going to read from the slide. Like all museums, uh, a Natural History Museum has three primary missions. So it's to build collections, which is um, all the specimens that we collect, uh, to facilitate research. So this is um, for all the science that's going on. And the last one is to educate, lah, which is what we are doing today. Um, but Apart from other, like how it differs from other museums is that the Natural History Museum, um, its subjects are not the products of human endeavors, but more of evolution. So um, <clears throat> natural history has a lot to do about the environment that we are in, particular nature. Okay, next. Okay, educating through exhibitions. So part of my work revolves um, helping out in our exhibitions. So the first part would be planning and setting up of the gallery space. Uh, if you can see in the screen right here, um, there are several pictures. So the first picture is of us setting up this, um, I think travel map of, of Alfred Russell Wallace in the gallery. Okay, and then uh, that's me right there standing next to a very large um, specimen, dry specimen. Okay, taxidermized of a, a cow. This is actually a cow, a male cow, so a bull. Yeah, so you get you get to see a lot of cool stuff when you work here. And then this cow thing is is for our latest exhibition, Body Snatches, happening now. So drop by if you're free. Okay, more pictures. Um, I had the chance to work with um this giant crocodile it's quite large you can see that it's being supported by two washing machines because we don't have like sometimes you don't have the proper equipment so we have to make do with what we have so it's supported by two large um vacuum no, wait, what's it? washing machines yes uh this this guy his name is kaiser actually he was donated to us by the singapore zoo so when when he died um, they did some taxidermy on him, but it wasn't done very well. So when when we when it was handed over, we took some time to actually restore the you know, crocodile. So in this picture, I was busy with uh, repainting the skin of the crocodile. Yeah, and then you also have to restore the missing teeth or the eyes, stuff like that. So initially, um, a lot of the content, right? they had the wrong things stuffed inside the crocodile, so which we had to remove 
And actually, all, all this was done uh, as part of an exhibition called Ayatenang 2019 by our conservator, Kate Parklington. Mm. And then in the picture on the left, we have uh, three bartenders in the gallery. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's, we are just setting up the lighting. La. So um, there's a lot of dust sometimes like in the higher parts of the gallery. I mean, be it being a large space and all. So before we hang up the lights, we have to clean it and make it sure make sure that they're working properly. La. So we were, we were setting up the lighting for this latest exhibition. And then, um, yeah, so a lot of the um, exhibits in the gallery, they are maintained, maintained by us, by our group of SAs. Next slide. Okay, so talking about the gallery, we also do uh, gallery maintenance, which is why we are closed every Monday. Yeah, so if you can see on the left, we have one of our SAs. Vacuuming the, the showcase. Yeah, so that crocodile is the same one that was featured in the previous slide. Um, yeah, so we, a lot of, like I said, uh, there's a lot of dust and dirt around in the museum when, like, even though it's just like normal day, uh, um, how we remove it is we, we use vacuum cleaners, um, we, we use a very large broom. Later, you can see in the next, next slide. Yeah, and then sometimes we have to go inside the showcase itself, like you can see in the picture. And it's quite a, an experience, uh, like being surrounded by all these like live animals. Sometimes it can be a bit creepy because uh, most of the time it's because of a power trip. So the lights will be totally off. So you have to go inside in the dark with all these uh, animals, right? And then the space is so confined because the light switch is all the way to the end. So you have to um, switch it back on. Yeah, but once, but once it's on, then everything else is okay. La. You just have to make sure that you don't um, touch or like bang into any of the specimens inside. Yeah. And inside can be a bit, how do you say? Like, like the air can be stifling because of all the, the dehumidifiers inside. And the, the prosop, la, which is this, this stuff that um, absorbs moisture so it doesn't damage the specimens. Yeah, so uh, another method of removing dust from our dinosaur. Um, usually what I would do is uh, there's this giant broom that we use to sweep the floors of the exhibit. Uh, we do it about once every two weeks. So we alternate between showcases once every, like every Monday will be a different part of the gallery. So cleaning is always continuous. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot to mention, if you have any questions along the way, just feel free to drop them in the chat so that later on we can, we can go through them one by one. Yeah. Yeah. So for all the dust that is settling on top of the dinosaurs, like our team on the right, okay, what they'll do is they will, um, use this air compressor. So they will actually blow off the dust on top of the, of the dinosaurs onto the floor so that you can sweep later. Yeah, so the thing about this dinosaur, right? It's, um, I think 80% real dinosaur fossil. Yeah, so how you can tell is, if you go to museums, right? Um, if the structure that is holding the bones together, okay, if, if it's just like holding the bones, then it's, it's real fossil. If the structure actually goes through the bone, then you know it's a replica, la, then it's not real. Yeah, so they are quite fragile. And actually, like some of, the, some of the parts are very light. Like even in this scenario, right? If you accidentally like, like spray too much air, it might actually like fall off the, the mound. Yeah, I have to stick it up from, so cute. Yeah, um, some of the issues in the gallery, um, like the lights, like sometimes the lights just like decide to take a holiday. So we have to resolve um, putting them back on. Uh, most of the time we try to do this before the gallery opens, uh, which is at 10 o'clock. But 
like a lot of times it will happen like during opening hours. So we have to go in between the showcases and um, switch them back on. But usually we'll choose a time where there are less visitors. Yeah. So things that can happen are like um, like missing numbers. Like, you know, a lot of people, they will like itchy finger and like, claw at the numbers, right? Yeah, don't do that lah, because we will have to go and replace the numbers. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes it's beyond our control. Lah. Like, for example, in the, the crab, right? Um, what we discovered was that the inside was a bit too dry, which caused the, the carapace of the crab to actually crack and break, break away. Yeah, so this crab is, is one of the largest crabs and one of the heaviest in the world is a Tasmanian giant crab. Right. Yeah, Tasmanian giant crab. Yeah, it's quite an expensive crab to buy. I think it's about like a few thousand dollars just for that single crab. It's quite big as well. I, I think there are, there are pictures later you can see. Okay, moving on. Yeah, so a lot of it is normal wear and tear, like labels, like sometimes people just like to peel at stickers and it just gets, keeps getting uh, worse. Lah. But usually we will you know, print a new one and paste over. Um, a lot of monitor issues, screen issues. And then sometimes we have like jars in the museum, not this jar, but like the museum jar with the specimens inside. Like they will, I don't know why they, they will shift like ever so slightly, like once in a while. Yeah. I hope it's nothing supernatural. Like you can see the thing just, just right over the edge, which is not supposed to be. Like. But we think it's probably due to like, you know, natural causes, like, like the vibrations of a building, but slowly we just shift. So we just shift it back. Like. Okay, so we now, from the galleries, we'll go to the collections, which is where I spend, um, most of my time inside. Okay, so collections, there are actually three levels worth of collections. We have the wet collections uh, for vertebrates on the second floor. Um, the wet collections for invertebrates on the third floor and then the dry collections on the fourth floor. So if you don't know the difference between vertebrate and invertebrate, so which basically vertebrates are animals that have backbones, uh, right? like your fish, your mammals, your birds, whereas invertebrates are things like insects, um, snails, crabs, yeah? And then dry collections is like all of them that are not preserved in ethanol or alcohol. Okay, so we go down to the fourth floor first, level four dry collections. Okay, I don't really do a lot of work in level four, but it's, it's nice to share, lah, right? Okay, so this assemblage of uh, pictures will show you how um, insects are dried and then pinned and then kept in the collections. So from left to right, you can see that the specimens are pinned to dry onto two pieces of uh, board. So they will, they will remain in this position until they are like fully dried, which we do in our drying cabinet, right? So when they're dry, they get stiff so that so you can you're able to manipulate them around so once they're dry you can see in this picture that they are being pinned by specialized um, insect pins so these pins uh, they come in many sizes so if you have like really small insects you can just pierce through and then once they are pinned they will be arranged in uh, trays so these are called unit trays um it's basically a acid-free cardboard box with a lining of foam that you can pin the insects to. Yeah, so they, were, they are usually arranged, um, arranged to species and then put together or maybe even collection uh, like data, like if they're collected at the same place, then they might be pinned that way. Yeah. And then after this tray, right, you put them in a box. So this box, there is um, a very good seal to the box. So it's not really a vacuum, but it's it's sort of like 90% seals the air inside so that nothing can go in. Yeah. Although some of them, like traditionally, they are stored in envelopes, like the dragonfly in this picture, which is very cute. Lah. And then all these boxes, they'll be stored 
in the large compactors in the in the in the collections. So they are arranged, they are stacked, just like not stacked lah, like slot, slotted into compactors nicely, and labeled accordingly lah. Yeah. So compactors actually um they protect the specimens, and then they also maximize the the storage space in our collections, and then it's very easily uh arranged according to the different groups, uh, taxa and uh, yeah, species. Okay, but before we go into the, before a specimen is actually put into the dry collections, so we have to freeze it first. Why we freeze them is because we want to get rid of all the uh, nasty things that might be on the specimen itself, like um, parasites or like uh, ticks, bugs. So small things that are on the specimens. Huh? So we have a freezer room. So the freezer actually goes below um, 20 degrees. So it, this, it can be quite cold. Huh? So this, this um, actually kills whatever um, unwanted insects or parasites that might be on the specimen itself before we proceed to storing them in the level four collections. Yeah, so we have a whole bunch of freezers. Huh? Yeah. Um, the process is quite specific because um, you freeze for about two weeks and then after freezing, you have to thaw them out for about a week or so because um, you know, it's, it, was, it, it gets so cold that there's this long thawing process, like similar to like when you thaw food before cooking. Okay, so from level four, we go down to level three. So this is our level three wet collections. Um, yeah, so the crab earlier you saw in the gallery, like this is an example of the crab. Yeah, it's quite big. Um, I'm not a very large person, so my hand is about average. So you can you can like sort of like roughly gauge the size of the crab from the picture. So in the level four collections, a level three collection, sorry. Um, it's a wet collection, so a lot of the specimens are contained in um, glass bottles that are filled with uh, alcohol or ethanol. Um, it's not pure ethanol; it's uh, diluted with seventy, with a bit of water. Um, seventy percent of the solution is ethanol; thirty percent is uh, RO water, which is reverse osmosis water. So it's not it's not exactly tap that water, we had to do a bit of filtration to get the water as clean as possible. Um, this is because we don't want any impurities affecting the condition of the specimens. So um, it's a bit different from level level uh, four because you can see that the comp compactors are actually exposed and it's more like a shelf system where you can just uh, arrange bottles in, in order. Yeah, so the specimens are stored here until un, un, until like somebody decides to maybe do some research and then they can come down and uh, select which specimens they want and then it will go through a system where we'll know what has been taken. So in a sense, you could call it like a library, a library where we store all the specimens are, but instead of books, it's just dead animals. Are. So that's that's a very good analogy, I think. Yeah. When I first started working here, my supervisor was like, yeah, it's basically a library of dead animals. Are. Okay. Um yeah. Um I think we are one of the largest collections of crustacea in Southeast Southeast Asia. If not the largest, then it's it, it's it should be the most uh important in terms of um, the kind of specimens that we have because this is like hugely because our director is a carcinologist which is a crab expert la. so he's been studying crabs for like many many years which has accumulated in this very large collection of crustacea uh, i'm going to talk about cataloging so what is cataloging so cataloging of specimens refers to um, assigning them a number, a label, 
and then keeping them in the proper container for safekeeping. So a bit about uh, cataloging and taxonomy. Uh, so we need every specimen has a label. So this is to, to show that um, what it is, where is it from, um, who collected it, and then when it was collected. And also if somebody has identified the specimen, like saying that, okay, this is uh, this kind of species. So we need to have that person's name on it as well, like who identified it and then when it was identified. Yeah. So a unique ZRC number would be the one in the picture. So it's, it's the same as like a, a library book where it has a serial number to it. And then if every serial number is unique in this museum, and then if you go to like other museums like around the world, right, they will also have their own unique serial number. So any serial number in, in, in a collection is unique everywhere, like in the entire world, there's only one unique number for it. Yeah, so species ID, you can see the, the label, right? Yeah, so a bit about the label itself, like the most important thing is on the number and then the species name and uh, sorry, the genus and then the species. So the genus and species or the scientific name rather, it has to be written in um, italicized font. Yeah, this is the, this is the standard. Uh. And then you also have, you need to indicate like the sex of the specimen. Is it a male? Is it a female? Is it a female with eggs? Or is it a male or female that has parasites in it? So that's also important. And then there's also the locality. So locality is where, where it was collected. So in this example, it is found in Malaysia, sandy area near coast behind Mastura Shelly, Tekekpe, Pulau Tioman. Yeah. So a uh, general rule of thumb is we will go like from the from a larger geographical location down to the smaller bit. But this also depends on each curator, like what they prefer. And this was collected by Profio et al. Et al just means like and others. So he wasn't alone in collecting this specimen. So he collected it on 24th June 1997. Yeah. So all this, like, why is this important? Like the collection date and everything. Because um, every instance of collection is actually a snapshot of history. So, like, for example, many, many years down the road, this thing goes extinct. So we will have to like if you want to know like when it was most popular or where, like when or how it happened, we have to know all these timestamps in history. So it's really important um, to have all this information like, uh, you know, um, properly documented for the future generations of researchers to come. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, so this is what a typical workstation would look like. Uh, you have to wear your a PPE, your gloves, you have a bunch of forceps to help you manipulate the specimens and then uh, several bottles of alcohol uh, to, to top up the bottles. Okay, then we have, like, if sometimes you have information sheet with us just to stand by. And then we will write the, the labels and then put them accordingly. All right. Okay, um, apart from, like, writing the labels, Another way of documenting specimens would be specimen imaging. Yeah, so it can be quite fun. Like you can see, like it's, it's quite fun to to take pictures of animals or rather like dead animals. Um, we have several, I think, photography units in the labs and in the collections to enable us to take various pictures of of different animals. Uh, um, so for larger specimens, we sometimes use a, like a photo booth, you can see in the picture. Yeah. So this was done, um, for one of our exhibitions uh, to, to, I think capture the image to put in the brochure, right? And then if you can see the crab over there, that is more of a photo for scientific research, like when they publish papers, uh, this kind of photo is very much needed to help in the explanation of um, the discovery. Like when they look at um, different crabs, you need to know what they look like. So this is a very good photo. Um, yeah, so a lot of it is um, very high definition. 
and very polished, which is very important. But sometimes, um, you know, like conventional methods don't really work. And then you have to think on the fly, like, okay, how are we going to take photo of something so large? Um, so they just happen to uh, think of this way, lah. you know, just put the lock on the floor and then uh, photograph it. So, okay, this, this, all these pictures were before COVID-19. So it's like, that's why they're not wearing masks, okay? Um, then the specimen on the right, top right, it's actually a parasite. Uh, it's a tapeworm. So this was uh, photographed using our microscope. Yeah, so there is a camera attached to a microscope that we can use to take pictures of really, really tiny stuff. So that measurement over there, I believe, is 200 micrometer. I, not, I think so. Yeah, it's that small. If you, if you look at it like in real size, it's about like less than a millimeter. It's that tiny. Yeah. So these are usually stored in microscope slides. Okay. Okay, so I think this is the most exciting part, right? expeditions and field work. Uh, sometimes we don't just work in a museum, we, have, we will have to go out and look for specimens and do surveys on the environment and stuff like that. So I'm just going to flood the screen with a lot of pictures now. Okay, um, local field work. So local field work is usually around coastal areas such as like Changi Beach, uh, Pasir Ris Park, sometimes even um, Pulau Ubin or you know, places like Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. And for all these um, sampling, right, we have the proper permits to do it from NPARCs and LTA. So please do not try this on your own. You will get into very big trouble. Yeah. So I've been part of uh, a lot of local field work the past uh, few years. Um, like the picture in the top right corner, top left corner, that that is us actually sampling for plankton in 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 coastal water in uh, our local waters. So we were doing sampling uh, in 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 areas like Sisters Island, uh, Pulau Hantu, and all these places. Um, yeah, So we we. We were, I think, in this in this uh, survey, we're we're looking at the the kind of plankton around the that that, that part of part of Singapore, uh, basically. And then, uh, bottom of that picture is is actually me in in the in the army pants, right? Yeah. So this was, um, I think, sometime five years ago, which is quite some time ago. Um, the area was gonna be, uh reclaim for for some reason but it's going to be reclaimed anyway so before it, it got reclaimed uh we we took the chance to go down and uh, collect whatever we could find there before everything was lost forever lah. yeah and then in the middle is i think one of the more recent ones it was at raffles lighthouse which is also a military installation um yeah, so I get we get to go to all these uh places that not a lot of people have have gone on to before. Uh, yeah. A lot of the times it's either intertidal field work, which is when the tides are low, we'll go and collect stuff from the coast. Or it's usually um night sampling, which is uh, light traps at night. So that's I'm I'm not involved in the in the in the night trap thing, but it's a very nice thing to share. So what they do is they place a large uh, shower curtain or bed sheet in, in the air and then they will like illuminate the, illuminate that the bed sheet with um like fluorescent light or magnesium beeper light. So what it does is it attracts insects to land on the sheet and then they can collect um whatever they want, basically. So it has to be done at night, obviously. Yep. So apart from local field work, I had the opportunity to work with some of our NUS students um, in, in, um, in their modules that involve overseas uh, field work and studies. So this was our module in Tioman. 
So what we did was um, we facilitated groups of students to go into the forests of Tioman and then can conduct their research projects there. So this particular project was um, setting up camera traps in the forest. So camera traps, what they do is um, it's motion centered. So we will plant the, the camera trap onto the trees. And then at night, when um, usually it's to, to get pictures of mammals. Well. So the mammals will, there'll be, a, there'll be like a bait sauce there on the floor, like food sauce for the animal, and to attract the animals. So the animals get attracted to the food sauce and then they will trigger the, trigger the camera, which will take pictures of them. So this was a very good um, method of knowing what kind of mammals do you get in the, in the area itself. So this particular group, I believe, I think it's, it's, it's a mixture of several groups uh, in the pictures. But what I think I remember one group wanted to find out the difference between using like real food as compared to um, just essence of the food. So they had like banana and durian essence in capsules and then they just leave it there. And then another trap, they put like actual food like peanut butter and tuna mixed together. Very delicious, right? Not really. Uh, but it works. Uh, um, we, have, we have very nice pictures of animals uh, at night. Especially mammals, because mammals, they usually come out at night. Yeah. Then, yeah, so expeditions proper. Um, the last few major ones were in Sarawak. Because we had, we had a MOU with their local <coughs> forestry department in, in the ministry. So we were allowed to go into the nature reserves and uh, do some sampling there. La. Um, usually these areas, because they are reserves, they are a lot less sampled than the other areas, which resulted in a few, I think, new species. Yeah. So in, in the top left picture, I was with another colleague of mine. We were preserving frogs. Yeah. So things like frogs, they require um, chemicals like formalin for them to actually freeze and harden not freeze uh, like remain in that position so that position is important in identifying what kind of frog it is yeah. so different um, animals require different ways of uh, preservation yeah and then like the middle picture is what our camp looks like at night yeah so it's very makeshift it's like a giant tent with a lot of um, like hammocks. So I, you can see me like getting ready to sleep and like in the hammock, and then obviously surrounded by mosquito net because, you know, forest everywhere, mosquito, next to the river, yeah, a lot of mosquitoes. Um, but there are a lot more sandflies as well. So yeah, things like this, are like, um, mosquitoes, sandflies, um, snakes, spiders, yeah, a lot of things out there to kill you. Um, this expedition also was um, a freshwater one. So we had to go, we were going around river sites and streams, sampling the different kind of fish that can be found in, 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 in those areas. Yeah. Um, and we also enlist a lot of locals in, in our help because after all, it is their, their land. So they know the area better. Yeah. So a lot of very scenic, times during expedition yeah so the picture on the left is actually their their kampong which is their longhouse yeah so they actually built everything on the hill um behind the river and it's it's, it's like very well built very picturesque and they're very very nice people yeah but sometimes we we, we do a lot of uh we need to de-stress sometimes, uh, if you can see in the, in the middle picture. Like we're just having fun, taking pictures. Uh, yeah, so early on, I mentioned something about the, the light trap. So if you look at that bed sheet in the top left, eh, bottom left corner, that's like all the insects in the world just like littered on that piece of um, uh, bed sheet. And like, they were literally like flying all over the place, like all over us as well. As well. 
so it was it was quite fun uh, to to like slowly pick up what we needed and then it is like quite unimaginable uh, like seeing like being surrounded by like, insects from everywhere like 360 degrees all around you um yeah so the picture on the right will give you a idea of how much um, equipment and food especially that we carry into the collection uh into the expedition so so all this has to be hand carried onto the boat and then out across to the river which is about i think okay to get to this location even it's about a two hour two three hour drive followed by like a four hour three four hour like long boat ride to the to the longhouse and then usually we will stay there overnight because we get tired from like moving all the things around. And then the next day we will take another three to four hour ride down to the to the campsite before we start um, doing our research. Yeah, so it's a lot of time spent traveling and it can be quite taxing as well. So yeah. So more pictures of us collecting. Uh, that, that's me in the top left. Um setting up a light trap that we designed to be able to collect insects that are far up in a canopy. So a canopy light trap, yeah, which we, um, I think nicknamed Wilson from the movie Castaway, played by Tom Hanks. So this was like 100% designed by us, which I, I, I thought was like quite clever. Lah. Like it's actually a pane of acrylic uh, being lit up by UV light. And then at the bottom, there is a trowel or a container holding ethanol. So what it does is it entices the insects to come to the light. And then once they hit the, once they latch onto the acrylic sheet, and then they will get dizzy by the ethanol and then fall to the ethanol. So this one was quite interesting because it collected insects that are very hard to reach, like at the top of the tree, that kind. But there was there's a there's also a caveat like, like there was one night where it was, I think, just after it rained, so this was a very big signal for termites to go out and fly. So that that particular night, the entire thing was just filled with termites, which was which was which wasn't very fun uh, to be honest. Then yeah, this is this is a makeshift lab. Oh sorry, makeshift lab in the in the ranger station that we happen to be in. Yeah, so sometimes we have very nice accommodations in the middle of the forest, like their own vinger or research stations. So they have like a proper lab to, to work in, which is very good and very comfortable. The only thing, however, is that everything is powered by a generator. So once the fuel runs out, then that's it. No more electricity, no light, nothing else. So it's just you and the forest. Yeah, so... Then in the bottom left picture, it's just me and um, Wei Song, one of our insect curators. So we were doing a pen trap, yellow pen trap um, sampling, which was, so as we walk along the forest, every like five meters or so, we will put down a yellow pen trap, which consists of a yellow uh, plastic plate. And then we fill it with soap water. So the insects, uh, very attracted to yellow. So if, if any of you like wearing yellow, you just be aware of this. Um, so they will come to the yellow, they will land on the soap water and then they will sink into the soap water because um, soapy water doesn't have um, that same level of water tension. So it will just like plop into the water and then we will come and collect um, the insects. Uh. Like what, what we're doing here is we are straining it. We are straining it in a um, mesh-like material. So this one is like, one trap, one pen trap every five meters, and then you do like like um twenty thirty pen traps. So that's quite that's quite a distance to cover actually. And then you gotta remember that it's it's usually like going uphill or downhill on on like forested terrain. So it's pretty taxing. Like a lot of us, when we come back from field work, we usually get very like a lot fitter than we, when we first started la, or we lose a lot of weight yeah then there's a bunch of my colleagues just sheltering from the rain in the car yeah so another big part of expeditions um 
the biggest one was just uh, my first ever actually um, cruise out at sea. <clears throat> this was the one where we found that giant eye support, which I will not show because it's been overused too many times really. Um, what we do is we trawl the bottom of the ocean and then uh, we will sort them out accordingly. La. So in the, in, in, from left to right, you can see us um, sorting all the, the larger samples in, and in this giant plastic um, containers. So we will sieve using a sieve of various uh, mesh sizes. We will sieve all the, the, the specimens out from the mud. So the bottom of the sea has a lot of mud, if you do not know. Then there's a picture of me. Um, sometimes you get um, like debris and, and, and tree trunks, wood branches, stuff like that. So we have to knock them out of, of, of that kind of uh, debris. And then we also have to take pictures of specimens, like what they're doing in the middle picture. Um, yeah, so all these people on the bottom, they're just sorting through all the specimens. So this one was a joint project with uh, the research organization in Indonesia. Yeah, so the ones uh, in blue basically are from Indonesia. The rest, the rest of the, the, the people are our own staff. Yeah, so this was quite, oh yeah, and also with, um, TMSI, which is the Tropical Marine Science Institute. Yeah, I got that right. Yeah. So it, it's quite happening. Uh. It looks like it, it looks like a like a market, right? Actually. Like they're sorting out all the all the specimens and stuff. And then you do get very nice uh, scenic views. Oh, let's see, when everything is calm. Uh. Um, because speaking of that, like the first day of our cruise, it was uh, the first day of a thunderstorm and then everybody was seasick and then it was raining and the ship was like rocking back and forth non-stop but we still had to work lah, basically so it was it's quite horrible but it got easier as, as, as time went by lah. yeah because like on the very last day of our cruise everything was like totally perfect the sea was so calm and the sky was so nice so it's like Somehow somebody knew that we were doing this. You stuck in a typhoon, right? Yeah, I think it was the tail end of a typhoon. So we had to, I think, stop for a while uh, in shallower waters. But it was still quite horrible. Uh, like, I think everybody was wiped out. Like, like, like literally, like nobody was showing up until like later part of the day. And it's like, where is everybody? Oh, everybody is just seasick in the bed. Yeah, so it's like, it's quite an experience. Uh, like, even when sleeping also, you will like rock back and forth or side to side, depending on the orientation of your bed. That's the important thing. So if you ever go to a sea, choose the, you better chop the, the right bit. Okay, and then um, I think to me, right, the big part of expeditions is the, the food that we get to eat. So um, I think it's, it's quite a nice feeling to be able to eat outdoors like while on expedition because like everything like everything we we had was not everything lah, like majority of the things we had like for example the fish um the chickens um, they're all from the jungle which was quite an experience because the fish especially they, they were so sweet and fresh um, and then they were caught by the locals yeah so some places we had like proper kitchens like the ranger station so we're like having, we're like one big family, like sitting there, you know, like eating together, resting at the end of the, end of the day. And, at certain, and at other times we, we had to like cook, cook on the spot beside the river, which was also fun like, because I mean like we're all having a good time, taking a break. And the food was, was quite delicious. Like. Um, yeah, I think... I think meal times is one of the best times yeah. expedition. It's like if you went army, right? Like some of you might might have gone army. It's like sometimes you're in army, the only thing you can think of is what time is dinner time or what time is lunch time. So not to say that that the work is like that, but sometimes you just feel that way because you are so tired. Okay. So that's about the end of my slides. I can stop sharing. Yeah. So, 
I'm going to try something different. He's going to answer questions while drawing. So I think um, he didn't mention that. Okay, what do you study, Zaki? Me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's very important, <laughs> but... Uh, so I, I studied fine art from NAFA, basically, before. So I, I don't have any science background before I started working here. I actually work here part-time first. And then it was when they first set up into this new building and then they needed a lot of help organizing the collections. So one of my jobs then was um, to unpack everything that was labeled, but it, it was labeled properly. Lah. So I just unpack everything, arrange them nicely in the shelves. And then from then, then they decided, yeah, we need it. We need, we need more help. And then since you're already here, and then you know a lot of stuff really. So why not, you want to join us? That's why I did. Lah. Yeah. I was doing art a few years before that, but I think over the years I have grown like very accustomed to this place, which is why I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, so I think like one thing very important to realize is that um you don't have to study science to have a career in 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 a like a natural history museum or conservation or biodiversity field, and I think it's quite a it's a very good example of that. So. Do you want to start drawing, Zaki, as you answer questions? I will read out interesting questions that have been asked. Okay. Um, Did they give me like things to draw? No, right? No. Okay, if anyone wants to... <laughs> okay, so um, you can send in a drawing request, but not if you type it in the chat box, if you unmute yourself and you ask Zaki yourself. Oh, really? Yeah. Condition where you get your drawing request fulfilled. Uh, yeah. Anyone want to unmute yourself to ask questions? Then you get to ask him to draw something for you. I'll just like randomly draw something. Uh... Yeah. Okay, you sing, you sing or Gan Hua Hui Ying. You have a question? Go ahead, unmute yourself. I would like to ask that why are the lights in the museum so dim? Because my mom can hardly read the signs. Mm, that's, a, that's a very good question, actually. And that's also a very uh, question that is that's um, been frequently asked a lot in the museum. So, because you know that light actually bleaches color from everything. Um, so what we want to do is we want to reduce the risk of that happening to our specimens. So if the light is very strong, then it will actually damage the specimens. So the specimens will lose a lot of their uh, color over time. So to prevent that from happening, we, we, we make it a very low light lah, so that um, the specimens will keep their time, uh, it will keep their color over very long periods of time. So that's why the, and not only, not only our museum, like if you notice like um, places like Art Museum, like our National Gallery of Singapore, our ACM, Asian Civilization Museum, basically a lot of museums, uh, their light levels are very low because um, the light will actually bleach the color of the artifacts or the specimens. So, yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Okay. Which is why we don't allow flash photography in the gallery because the flash from your camera, right, can uh, affect the color of the specimens over time. Yeah, so you see, you can get to ask Kazaki to draw something for you. Huh. <laughs> uh, can you draw that like big boy eye so oh, oh, cool. okay. Nice. <laughs> Okay, so I'll just answer a couple of questions. Are uh, expeditions halted during the pandemic? Yes. Okay, that's a very good question because everyone in the research team at the museum is very frustrated that uh, expeditions have been halted. So yeah, because travel has been halted, right? So we can't go out, uh, even locally also, it's very difficult to go out uh, on intertidal trips uh, or terrestrial trips because you need to maintain your safe distancing and yeah, we used to have a lot of like overseas trips like what Zaki mentioned, like his um, Sajade's expedition as well as the terrestrial expeditions. All of that has been stopped. Hmm. But we are able to, uh, I think, do local field work. 
Yeah, in uh, recently, especially when it's been relaxed. Yeah, so the last trip that we went to was to Pulau Satumu. Yeah, but I think the research team also went to like Tanjong Bimau and all that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sentosa, yeah. Tanjong Bimau is in Sentosa. What? Tanjong Bimau is in Sentosa, but it's yeah. not accessible to the public. Yeah, in case you're wondering. Mm, yes. Okay, so how long do you have to wait before collecting the traps back? Okay, um, you want to answer that, Lucky? Can you uh, more? Which trap? Yeah, it depends on the trap you're asking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think if the if it's a yellow pen trap, right? So what you will usually do is uh in the morning, like I think about seven or nine, we will we will set up the traps and then um we will go back for lunch. And then after lunch, we will go back out and collect them again. Yeah, that's how long we will wait to collect the, the traps. Or yeah. sometimes it's, it's over it's even left out there um overnight. But we don't usually do it like, in case it rains. And sometimes it does rain. So what we do is we have to hurry out and collect everything back if possible. If not, then oh that's just too bad. Like, like some of the stuff might um spill out. Yeah. And then you 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 have to come to lose some specimens forever. Long. I mean it is nature, right? So sometimes you, you have to do what you can. That's that's the only way. Long. Yeah. Yeah. I think for the Sajadis expedition, um I mean uh because you're asking about how the traps, how long the traps were left, right? So I think Sajadis expedition it's the nets, uh the dredge nets, right? Yeah. So the, the net actually Ah, no, it's, it's a lot longer than that. So um, the sea can be as deep to about like a kilometer or 1.5 kilometers down. So it can take up to at least mm. one hour just to lower the net to reach the floor. And then it will trawl, it will drag for another about half an hour. Yeah, it's hour. Really there, right? for half an hour. Yeah, and then another, another hour to bring it back up. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of... Um, you can see that there's a lot of waiting period in between, like a three-hour waiting period, right? So within that, that three hours, we will have to do all the sorting from the, from the previous catch, actually. Yeah. So if if like the previous catch, um, there's not a lot of stuff, then this is a bit of a break like, for us. But if the previous catch, there's like, a lot of things, right? Or well, then it's like, you better finish it before the next uh, catch goes up. Yeah, so that is the kind of struggle that we, we can have. Wow. While, while doing this kind of work. Yeah, when the dredge comes up, then it's like, whoa, there's so many things to sort. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah, speaking about that, right, like, certain parts of the, the sea, right, it's just filled with marine trash. Mm. Yeah, so imagine, like, sorting through everybody's trash, uh, looking for specimens. Um, The smell is just particularly horrible, so that's not a very good thing. So remember, don't throw anything into the sea. Okay, there's another interesting question. So in the field and on expeditions, how do you decide which animals and species to collect and preserve? Yeah, so usually when we go out, um, we will, it's, it's um, Helm, or rather like the leader of the, the expedition is one of our curators. So every curator has the um, specific group of animals that they're working on. So for example, um, in Sarawak, we are we are looking for fish, right? And then so the curator will know what kind of fish he's looking for, um, whether they are common or uncommon or quite rare, you know that kind. So if so he will he will be able to recognize like okay, this one got too many already, so we don't collect anymore. Or like, oh this one is very rare, we should keep like one, you know. But keep in mind that when we are collecting, we are not destroying like the entire population. We are um, keeping what we need and then like um, also making sure that we do not um, threaten the population so if and then there are also some specimens or uh, some animals that, that are under CITES so you cannot catch them yeah so that's how we know like, what to collect what not to collect yeah and like one important thing is also that you cannot conserve what you don't know so therefore you have to collect animals to conserve them. But yeah, like what Zaki said, it has to be at a 
certain level. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay what's next? Next. Oh, there. So you have your. Do you want to explain what that is? Your Darth Vader isopod. This one. Yeah. Oh yeah. So this um the one that we found we actually found a, a new species that 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 trip. It's called uh, Petinomus raksasa. Raksasa meaning uh, monster in Bahasa and also in Malay as well. So why it was called raksasa is because it's quite obvious that it's, it's, it's a monster of a, of a specimen. Like it's so big and that's what they decided to call it. Yeah. So it's um, we're very happy and relieved when we found it because like then going through all the physical work of, of, of sorting to find something so spectacular was well finally like it's like it validates us being out at sea in, in like choppy waters. So. Yeah. I think research trips are very cool and very interesting, but there's like a lot of hard work that goes behind it. So like for Sajadis, it's two year preparation for that two week expedition. How much of like risk you have to take, you need to make sure that everything goes well for that two weeks. There's a lot of hard work behind that. Okay. Um, oh, <laughs> does a museum accept internships in such museum? Uh, we actually have a job opening. So if you want to do what Zaki does, which is a specialist associate, uh, we have a job opening. Uh, and you can look at it at our Facebook page. Let me see the answer. Yes, let's see if we have. Can the public have access to taxidermized birds from your museum? And the purpose is to do study sketches. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we are not allowed. We do not, we do not permit public to go into like our collections. Uh. But I think we are working on some art programs, right? We might be, we might be working on some art programs to allow um, like schools to do that. Uh. So, it might be a thing of in the future, but currently I don't think we we it's like it's just a lot for staff only, yeah. Yeah, and like visiting researchers and scientists. Yes, researchers. We have about like a million specimen collections in in the museum. So what's on display is about four thousand, four thousand over specimens. So everything else is stored in our wet and dry research labs. So it's only available to visiting scientists, researchers, so that they can do their work. Okay. How do you decide the theme for display? The theme for display? Uh, I think if you were to like gallery display. Yeah. So uh we have a convert con converter. Conservator. <laughs> <laughs> conservator working with us. Actually our senior conservator, uh Miss uh, Kate Buckington. So she is the one that uh, usually decides uh, what exhibits to, to show. But um currently right like the, the so we have our permanent our permanent displays permanent displays uh if you have never been to the collect uh museum before they are basically a broad overview of everything la. so you have your mammals your reptiles your insects you know your birds your fish so all these are um, equally displayed across the gallery so that People, uh, you know, that are not familiar with animals, they get to experience everything in one. And also being um, part of Southeast Asia, we will showcase um, the things that can only be found in Southeast Asia. Yeah, so it's different from like other stuff from like maybe the Americas or the more temperate countries. Yeah. Yeah. What's next? Okay. Anyone has any other questions that you'd like to unmute yourself to ask? I saw one question that I think is like, uh, do you like your job? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you like your job? Do I like my job? Huh. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes a job is a job. But, I mean, I love my job, man. Like, I love the, it's like every day I learn something new. Like, like everybody here is um, very welcoming in terms of like, 
if you are like looking for knowledge, you know, they are very open to sharing what they know. And then a lot of the things um, I learned on the job. Yeah, so what else is there? Um, I mean, I love animals, right? Dead or alive, I love animals. So having the, I, I can't even imagine like working here in the first place, you know, but it's it's actually very I'm I'm I, I consider to myself to be very fortunate to be able to work here. So yeah, in, in, in short, like yeah, I, I, I love my job. Yeah. And of course if you're hearing this <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think we are we are a bit the same, I would say. Yeah, I love I love my job. <sighs> yeah, I feel like every day you learn something new, which is really cool. There's so many specimens in the museum collections. Are there many specimens just catalogued and kept and not researched? Oh yes. Yes. So um and okay, why right? Why do you why why like somebody wonder like why are there so many things that is just there living like left in the collection for like many years? Well, like I was saying earlier, um sometimes it's and we go, we go and we can to sample whenever we can because it serves as a very important timestamp in history. Because you have to remember that we are a history museum, but natural history. So, natural history meaning um, the animals and plants that occur around us. So, if we are able to collect something from a specific place at a specific time, then that is that time, like a like a photograph, lah. So you know that okay, in this time period. You know that these animals exist, and then what is their distribution? How many are there? You know how well are they doing? So that you can compare over time, like are the numbers like going down, or are they like you know like is the number increasing? You know what is how does it affect the environment? So all these um things are uh, are very useful for researchers if they want to do things like for the environment and and ecology lah. Um also. Yeah, I mean, like sometimes the the amount of research done is slower than the amount of collecting done because research will take a lot more time than um the act of collecting itself, like. So, uh, we also work, we also waiting for I mean, like aspiring young biologists out there to come and you know work on these kind of things in the future, like. So and when they when they, when when they do. It's is there really available for them to do to do so? Now oh, you sound like boss. Huh? Now oh, you sound like boss. <laughs> I, I, I work <laughs> under him. Like I'm like the closest, one of the closer ones. Yeah, is it legal to build personal collections in Singapore? Uh I I don't I don't know about if it's legal or not, but I know that it's not legal to collect, uh, stuff. So, I mean, if you happen to have it, then you have it already, lah, right? But if you actively go out and take things from nature, it's not allowed. If I'm not wrong, correct? Yeah, she confirmed. Yeah, so you can't really, yeah. You cannot collect, but if you already have, then you have, lah, you know? That's all I can say. Yeah, so for example, don't go out to the forest and like put a yellow pen trap and put soap there. Yeah, you're not supposed to do these things because we do it with permits uh, from the relevant authorities. And most probably the cleaner will come and take your pen trap away. <laughs> so don't do it. Okay, I think that's about it. Does anyone have any final questions? Because it's already 9.05. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If not, I will share my slides again. What are you drawing? Somebody requested a lion. So I'm trying to draw. Okay, so while he's still drawing, I will go through the last couple of slides. So we've done with the questions and answers. Um, so at the start, Saki mentioned about this new temporary gallery exhibition that we have. So we just yeah. on the 30th of October. It's called Body Snatchers, Nature, Zombies, and Vampires. So um, it's all about parasites. And we always think about parasites as very gross and disgusting creatures, you know, then you get grossed out by them, right? But they're actually very important because they keep our ecosystem together. They have a role to play in the natural environment. And come over to the museum to find out more about the stories behind them. 
Yeah, so I think someone asked the question about how do we decide uh, the themes, right? So even for the temporary gallery, so um, Kate, our gallery in charge, uh, she comes up with these themes. So this is her brain. Yeah, also, sometimes we, like, if, it's, it's open to the staff, lah, like, if some staff, they feel like they want to showcase something. So yeah. they will push Kate saying, oh yeah, I maybe we can do this next time. Can yeah. you about it and see if it's appropriate? Yeah, I think one, one thing about uh, the museum is that we are just open to feedback from everyone, like all staff. So we have, a, we have good working relationships between the different units as well. So that's why you see a lot of nice things happening. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. So come down to Body Snatchers. And for those of you who are still online, we'll greatly appreciate uh, if you could fill in a feedback form by uh, scanning the QR code, which will lead you to the uh, feedback form. And if you'd like to support our research and education efforts and you'd like to donate some of money, you can also scan the QR code on the left. Yeah, we'll still be hanging around here for about five minutes or so. So if anyone who wants to unmute yourself and ask Zaki any questions, please do so. Can let me go through? I think I can go through the collection. Hey. Are there, did I miss courses in Singapore? Uh, no, no. There, there are no taxidermists. Like, Official courses, there are, there are none in Singapore. Is yeah. it legal to taxidermize the dead wild bird that died in the desert area? I don't think it is illegal, but you must be very careful in handling like, like life matter. Uh, yeah, because like, there might be things like lice and things that. You right. know. So yeah. you might not know like the cause of death, so it might be harmful to you. Mm. Yeah. Oh, you have a nice compliment there by Zailani. As a fellow natural historian in the neighboring country. I assume that's Malaysia. What would happen if the crab carapace cracking is a unique fossil from millions of years ago? Whoa. Uh, fossils might not. I think they can, okay, anything can crack, right? But usually fossils, we will not display it like that. We will, we will, we will display it in a, in a better showcase. And I think it's a lot more durable than, than a crab because the crab is just the, the carapace only, there's nothing inside. So it's a bit hollow. We you get all these animals um, everywhere. Mm. On the jungle floor, species is specific type of, is it real? Is everything real? Everything here is, Sure, so in the museum, right? Another question that people usually ask, like, is it real? Like in the museum? Yes, everything in the museum is the gallery in the gallery last specifically is real, unless we say it's not real, like if it's a model or something. What if the glass container shatters? Uh then we have to find another glass container. Like it, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Sometimes it happens like you accidentally knock to something, then it will either crack. Shatter is a bit like exaggerated, lah, but it will like break or something. Like. So I mean like not to worry, just you know clean up the mess and then just replace the glass. Oh, yeah, it happens. How do you make sure that the number is unique to this universe? I don't know about universe, but uh that's a good question actually. I think every museum I think it's a it's a common it should be a common um very like understanding between different museums to to use a different number uh, the format will be different uh, like um usually when when we have we we're doing all this research yeah, we are talking to a lot of people from other museums as well so we we'll know what's going on then they will have their own unique identifiers to the thing so we do not mess up yeah internships. I think you, you mentioned earlier like internships, but internships, if you happen to be an NUS student and then you're doing your final year project, but you want to do a final year project, you can do final year internship instead in the museum. Like we, we do have that if you're interested. Uh, how do you know the number has been used? We have, a, yeah, so another good question. How do you know if the number has been used? So we have an online database called the Collection Management System where every number is, in, is, is input into the system so that we do not have this problem of um, using the same number, which has happened a few times really. So 
if it does happen, um, we'll just change the number, lah, basically. Yeah. It's not a good thing, but it has happened. But we deal with it when we can. Uh, professional photographers. Um, yeah, some of us are very good at photography. So usually, um, we, we have the equipment and we have the expertise. So usually, we don't hire professional photographers. We'll do everything in house, uh, yeah. And then because like for us is the specimens are important, so we minimize the risk of any damage that can be done to the specimens from a third third party. Yeah. Where are those places in the expeditions? Uh, so the places are Sarawak. Uh, some like nature reserves. Uh, the cruise is in uh, South Java Sea, which is the bottom of Java. Uh, it's called Sajadis, which just means South Java. No way. Okay, never mind. You can you can Google it. I can't remember now. <laughs> Sajadis twenty eighteen. South Java Deep Sea Expedition. Yes. You know the funny thing, right? I actually came out with the name, but I cannot remember. Do you sample sharks or whales? No. Um. For yeah, for large mammals, um, large specimens basically, we don't go out and kill them. Usually, we will get donations from public, or like the government agencies will call us and say, "Oh yeah, this is dead." Yeah, like the like the whale we have in the museum. Yeah, so actually, like Jurong Island called us or the Parks called us and said, "Yeah, there's a dead whale in Jurong Island. Do you want it?" Yeah, so we took it Yeah, yeah. but. Things like insects, crustaceans, basically a lot of invertebrates are snails, um, marine life. That's what we sample. Yeah, so if you don't know about the sperm whale, uh, the skeleton is now very nicely sitting on display in the gallery. So it was washed off Jurong Island in 2015. Come visit if you have not. Uh, we don't sample reptiles or so like this person terrapins or leatherbacks or snakes. No, we don't do that. Uh then it's answer it. What if you don't have a house for a lab laboratory? But then I can't help you. But yeah, since you have a car, why don't you just sleep in the car instead of hammock? Because the places we go to don't have roads. So <laughs> we have to like either sometimes take a boat down the river all the way inside the deep parts of the forest or we have to walk lah. yeah so i've walked like maybe two three hours just to go to the site and stay there yeah so it's quite fun if you're very fit it's, it's very easy if not then yeah were you attacked by sea animals during the sea journey no um actually human beings are the most harmful and dangerous um, animals in the world so top of the food chain uh, we did, however, encounter dolphins during the sea journey, which was very rare. We were like very near the Indian Ocean, and they were like a bunch of bottlenose. Can't remember what kind of dolphin, but the dolphins were there, so it was quite cool. Dinosaur. Somebody wants a dinosaur. Anything else? Are there any challenges with having enough storage? Sorry? Are there any challenges with having enough storage? I think the... There's not enough storage. So, <laughs> <laughs> what, we, what we're doing is we are maximizing storage as much as we can. So, we have existing shelves. Then we are adding more shelves in between the shelves. So... Mm -hmm. And that's part of my job also, like um, arranging all the specimens as we shift. And then as we shift the specimens to their new locations, uh, we will have to, you know, like do maintenance on them, like clean the bottles, make sure the specimens are okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we've overshot by quite a bit, but... Yeah. This is the last session for this year. It's already 9.20, so thank you very much, everyone. Have a very good evening. If you would like to send in any questions, just feel free to send it to this email address that I am going to type in the chat box.
Yeah, any inquiries, anything, just drop us an email. Thank you very much for joining us today.